Hi, I'm Bob Welsh. I'm a storyteller. And I'd like to tell you a story of one of our very first mountain men, John Coulter. John Coulter was a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and they went from St. Louis all the way out to the Pacific. And on their way back in the uh, Rocky Mountains, John Coulter asked permission to have a discharge and remain there. See, this was a military expedition. Well, they let him stay in the mountains and they returned to St. Louis. And a couple years later, John Potts, another member of the expedition, worked his way back up into the Rockies. He found John Coulter and the two trapped beaver together. Well, they dared to venture into what is today southern Montana. It was Blackfeet Indian Territory, forbidden territory for any other Native American or any white man. Well, they had an encounter with the Blackfeet tribe. I drove to Three Forks, Montana to walk the ground where this encounter occurred to be able to get the feel to write my story I call Coulter's Run. Two mountain men, a small canoe, a creek they'll navigate, was near a place they call Three Forks, the year 1808. John Coulter at the vessel's bow to check each beaver trap. A man named Potts was in the stern, long rifle on his lap. Their traps were set just after dark and checked first light of day. If they were caught in Blackfoot land, a horrid price they'd pay. But little did these mountain men suspect their pending fate that half a thousand Blackfoot braves lay silently in wait. They stepped out from the underbrush and everything was stilled. The mountain men had no escape and knew they'd both be killed. Their death would not be merciful once torture had begun. Refusing to be killed this way, Potts aimed and fired his gun. A Blackfoot grabbed and clutched his chest then crumbled to the ground. And then a score of bows unleashed that whiz and arrow sound. He died with rifle in his hand. A noble way to go. But Coulter's left to face a death, a death that's cruel and slow. They quickly pulled him onto shore. He looked him in the eye. He mutely told the Blackfoot tribe, I'm not afraid to die. They asked him if he liked to run, if he was very fast. He said he didn't like to race. He always came in last. They grinned and said, you're going to run from spear and axe and knife. And when you lose this race today, you also lose your life. Well, they stripped him down till he was bare. They took his shoes and gun. They knew he was defenseless now, but not how he could run. The Blackfoot chief led Colter out 200 yards away, a naked man without a prayer. He made a sad display. The fastest runners in the tribe, a number 50 strong, were betting who would run him down, a run that won't take long. He'd heard of how the Blackfoot ran like wind-driven flame, and not a single man survived who played their deadly game. But Colter felt he stood a chance. His legs and lungs were strong, and courage of a mountain man is why he lived this long. To get away, he must run straight, like antelope in flight. He'd seen how wolves would make up ground if prey cut left or right. So when the chief told him to run, he didn't hesitate. He took off for a distant knob, a mile he'd estimate. He heard the yells to seek revenge and felt his worst to fears. The fastest runners on the plains were chasing him with spears. The power in his quadriceps from climbing steep terrain gave him an awesome burst of speed and lead he had to gain. He yelled a grueling sprinter's pace a thousand yards or so. He had to gain more precious ground and never let it go. The cactus plant and prickly pear, a naked runner's bane, ripped through his feet. They swelled and bled, but John ignored the pain. The Indians now had ceased to yell while Colter held his lead. A number started trailing off, baffled by his speed. He cruised on past his mile mark. His pace was long and sure. His stamina was resolute. His feet he must endure. He pushed to stay out far ahead. He had the will to live. But screaming muscles mutely said, That's all we have to give. 
pursuers kept on falling back. But one was out ahead, and he was slowly gaining crown on colder as he fled. John fell into a miler's pace as desert floated by. No longer could he feel the pain. It's called a runner's high. His thoughts now drifted far away and back to childhood. He saw the farm where he grew up and where the cabin stood. He thought about more recent times with Lewis and with Clark. Would anyone remember him? Had Colter left his mark? Then searing pain in both his feet soon brought him back in check, along with that last warrior breathing down his neck. His burning lungs demanded air. His mouth was dry as clay. His nasal veins had hemorrhaged now, and blood began to spray. He heard a runner close behind and got a sudden fear. If he got close enough to throw, he'd gore him with a spear. He knew the only way to live was turn and make a stand. So all at once he dug his heels into the prairie sand. The two were only yards apart when Colter spun around. The warrior tried to stop in vain but stumbled to the ground. Then Colter dove and grabbed the lance and tried to wrest it free. His only hope to stay alive but not a guarantee. This mountain man and Indian fought, one's life the only prize. A sharpened spear would be the judge of which one would arise. A violent fight, a sudden thrust. A man lay deathly still. John Colter had only come to trap, but now he'd had to kill. No time to rest or think about the vile deed he'd done. His fate was sealed and only hope was turn around and run. The closest runners to him now, a quarter mile back, would find their friend and be enraged then dog him on his track. So run he did, his hope renewed, that ground-breaking stride. The river called the Madison, his tracks would surely hide. It lay a couple miles ahead, John Colter knew it well. Its banks were lined with cottonwood, oak brush, and chaparral. Endurance slowly given out, his feet looked like a sieve. He'd lost a lot of blood and strength, but not the will to live. He makes it to the river's edge, and then without delay, he plunges in the icy stream. It takes his breath away. The current moves him down the stream. He keeps his head afloat. Cold water on his burning feet is just the antidote. The black feet soon will swarm the banks, like bees on the attack. If he gets out the other side, they'll surely find his track. And then he spots a tangled jam of logs and stuck debris. He dives and swims up underneath the only place to flee. He wriggled up through sunken logs where moss and reeds entwined and found a hole to poke his head above the water line. Then soon he heard the muffled sounds of voices overhead. Did they suspect he's under here? Should he have run instead? But up and down the banks they looked, searching everywhere, and several times a sharpened spear would pry into his lair. As hours passed, he stayed submerged in water swift and cold. His trembling body, turning blue, just fought to keep a hold. When voices left and darkness fell, no one was encamped. He floated out and crawled ashore, all doubled up and cramped. He knew they'd start the search again at first morning light. So Colter forced himself to move and traveled through the night. When morning sun began to rise, he hid and slept the day. And when the sun began to set, he's up and on his way. He pushed himself for seven days with roots, his only meal, and found refuge at Lisa's fort and told of his ordeal. John Colter beat tremendous odds with fortitude and speed, a naked man without a prayer who never would concede. So when you feel that all is lost, that victory can't be won, just take a breath, refuse to quit, and think of Coulter's run.